It is Saturday, the 8th of December, 2018. I apologize for the show being late this week and for missing the last two episodes. I've had a full plate lately. Today, in this episode, I'm flying solo, and as you've noted from the title, this will be my final regular episode. More on that later. I'm breaking today's show into three parts. The first is basically the normal episode. The second contains an additional commentary on my perception of where crypto is going in the long, long term. And the third is an explanation, third part, an explanation of why I'm moving on and what I'm moving on to. So let's get straight into it. Part one, topic number one, the crypto roundup, top 10. Bitcoin, number one, Ripple XRP, number two. Ethereum, number three, Stellar, four, Tether, five, Bitcoin Cash, six, Bitcoin SV, seven, EOS, eight, Litecoin, nine, Tron, 10. Wow, what a shakeup we've had the last few weeks. It's been amazingly frustrating and frightening, probably for many. <laughs> As a hodler, it's always uh, a bit sad to see value go out of your holdings, but Technically, I didn't lose anything because I didn't sell. I still own the same number of safe coin and the same number of a few other coins. So technically, I may have lost value relative to the US dollar, but relative to the number of coins I had, I still have them. So, hey, I'm happy. Bitcoin dominance, 54.8%. That really hasn't changed overall. I think it's about roughly about the same as it's been. Although um, certainly some coins have gone up a lot relative to Bitcoin and down a lot relative to Bitcoin over the past few weeks as the markets took a big downturn. Okay, next, let's have a look at the seven day chart. See, we started out the week at about 130.7 billion and we've ended the week at about 110 billion. So, yet another down week. Volume has moved higher toward the last the end of the week here. And finally, Blocktivity, EOS number one, Wax number two, Tron three, BitShares four, Kin five, Steam six, Ethereum all the way down to number seven, Bitcoin eight, Komodo nine, and Waves rounds out the top 10. You can see Ethereum is still maxed at 81,750 unconfirmed transactions. That's about par for the course uh, of late. Even though uh, it's it's dropped down to number seven on the overall activity list, it's still uh, pretty high uh, with un pretty, a pretty high load of unconfirmed transactions. Bitcoin also uh, still high, but does come down a fair bit uh, since we did the last show. Now down to 76.84%. So wow, EOS up to a whole 0.47%. It looks like it's higher than that on the little thing. I wonder about their percentage thing. Anyway. Let's move on to our top headlines this week. Number one, MasterCard files patent for increase in anonymity of blockchain transactions. MasterCard has filed a patent for a method of anonymizing transactions on a blockchain, according to an application published by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Filing outlines that the use of one or more intermediary addresses to obscure the source and destination of funds in a blockchain transaction can be used in order to increase anonymity of entities associated with blockchain addresses. The proposed technical solution would entail a series of anonymization requests designed to anonymize the transactions themselves rather than just the user behind any individual wallet. Well, I, why, why would MasterCard want, want to do that? I mean, seriously, why would they want to do that? Would, would the government, would any government even allow them to do that? Or, or is this maybe just a way of monopolizing certain patents and preventing the future use of anonymity on blockchain? Of course, there's already anonymous coins, and they know that. So this article goes into more detail. Link will be in the show notes. Next headline, U.S. crypto exchange Coinbase adds support for Zcash on retail platform and mobile apps. So that's big news. Uh, again, kind of with the last one, what, why would they do that? You know, they haven't seemed to be supportive of that sort of thing. I guess um, maybe they sense that a lot of people are going to be more inclined to, to use these sort of things in the future. So major American cryptocurrency exchange and wallet provider Coinbase has launched support for Zcash at Coinbase.com and the exchange's Android and iOS apps, according to a blog post published December the 5th. 
per today's announcements, Coinbase customers can now purchase, sell, send, receive, and store Zcash. Uh, the coin will be available for customers in most jurisdictions, but initially customers from the United Kingdom and the state of New York will not be able to use the service. Coinbase further notes that additional jurisdictions may be introduced later. Um, I'm going to read some more of this. I don't normally read so much of the headline, but there is some interesting bits here to, to kind of clarify. The situation. Since Zcash is a digital currency based on decentralized blockchain and designed with the goal of making transactions more private than they are on the Bitcoin blockchain, it deploys specific features of cryptography to protect the privacy of its users. Coinbase therefore outlines in the post initially, customers can send ZEC, that's Zcash, to Coinbase from both transparent and shielded addresses, but only send off Coinbase to transparent addresses. In in other words, the, the, the addresses that can be seen, not not shielded. In the future, we'll explore support for sending Zcash to shielded addresses in locations where it complies with local laws. So if you if you send Zcash from your shielded address, um, I'm not sure how exposed you'll be, but obviously your shielded address will be recorded to an extent. I'm not sure. I don't know too much about Zcash, but they're not going to let you send to shielded addresses, meaning it's it's kind of a one way trip. So. <laughs> I wouldn't personally be doing this. If I were using Zcash, I would send my Zcash, I would convert it probably through some other method. I mean, I don't know why you'd want to move it to Coinbase anyway, but anyway, I would be very careful about that sort of thing. Next headline, confirmed NASDAQ's Bitcoin futures will launch in the first half of 2019. The world's second largest stock exchange, NASDAQ, has confirmed it plans to launch Bitcoin futures in the first half of 2019. United Kingdom daily tabloid, The Express, reported on Monday, December 3rd. As reported before previously, two insider sources had already leaked the plans to Bloomberg in late November. Yesterday's confirmation from Joseph Christinat, vice president of NASDAQ's media team, clarified the launch remains subject to approval from the United States Commodities Future Trading Commission, the CFTC, although reportedly, quote, there's been enough work put into this to make the question of regulatory approval academic. We are doing this and it's happening, end quote. So there you go. So that, that's pretty big news, I reckon. One way or the other for Bitcoin, that's pretty big news. Uh, next and last top headline I'm going to be giving this week. Uh, Switzerland's crypto valley Zug ranked fastest growing tech hub in Europe. The Swiss city of Zug, home to crypto and blockchain development hub Crypto Valley, has been ranked the fastest growing tech community in Europe. Swiss startup news channel Startup Ticker reported this on December the 6th. According to the latest annual State of the European Tech Report from London headquartered global technology investment firm Atomico, Zug came out top in a comparison of year on year growth of attendees to tech related meetup events per European city with a 177% increase as compared with last year. You can see Russia came in very close. Uh, Novo Sir Novosibirsk, Russia. Sorry, sorry, Russian uh, listeners. I cannot pronounce the name of that town very well. 173%. So pretty much, you know, percentage of error. I reckon they're about the same, honestly. Then Ghent, Belgium, 165%. Probably also within the margin of error. So I'd reckon they're all about the same. The Hague, Netherlands, and uh, Poland, uh, Katowice, Poland, Dortmund, Germany, Newcastle, United Kingdom. Sofia, Bulgaria, Essen, Germany, and Cardiff in the UK came in, rounded up to the West. <clears throat> so, yes, interesting place. I guess if you're looking at starting a crypto business, this kind of information could come in handy. Something to keep your eye on anyway. Uh, next, we have a key stories of the week. We've got two this week. The first, EOS community is challenged after Node announces financial rewards for votes. So what's this all about? This week, the EOS blockchain protocol angered decentralization proponents yet another time. Specifically, Start EOS, one of EOS's officially sanctioned block producers, appeared to publicly offer its token holders financial rewards in return for their votes. Start EOS vote buying tendencies seem to fall in line with previous scandals centering around EOS. This year, the blockchain protocol reversed previously confirmed transactions and started an internal investigation after Huobi, its other block producer, one of its other block producers, was accused of running a corruption scheme, among other things. 
I'm not sure if that was ever proven or not, but yeah, something to look into. A brief introduction to EOS and its key features. EOS.io is a blockchain-powered smart contracts protocol for the development, hosting, and execution of decentralized applications. It was launched in June 2018 as open source software, while the first testnets and the original white paper emerged earlier in 2017. The platform was developed by Block One, a startup registered in the Cayman Islands and led by Daniel Larimer and Brendan Bloomer. EOS has raised the most funds during its ICO. Uh, incomplete sentence. Uh, the startup managed to gather around 4.1 billion worth of investments after fundraising for nearly a year. That number remains unmatched to date. That's 4.1 billion dollars. I wonder how much of that they still have, given the they may have they have kept some of it in Ethereum, and the price of Ethereum has dropped dramatically. Maybe they took it all out and put it into dollars. I don't know. The protocol is supported by the native cryptocurrency EOS, currently the sixth largest crypto by token market cap. Is that is that true today? Let me just go back and check. EOS is actually number eight today, so it's had another big drop. Um, uh, though those tokens can be staked for using network resources, either for personal use or leased out for developer use. Basically, EOS.io attempts to represent a decentralized alternative to cloud hosting services. EOS employs a consensus model called delegated proof of stake. Essentially, that means that its investors are rewarded with voting power and decide who gets to mine the EOS blockchain. Hence, the EOS ecosystem rests on at least two major entities, the EOS core arbitration forum, effectively its judicial branch, and block producers who produce blocks on the EOS blockchain, just like miners do with the Bitcoin blockchain. Block producers earn EOS tokens produced by inflation, according to some estimations, Two EOS block producers obtain around 1,000 tokens per day. They are elected through the constant voting process, and their number is capped at 21. Consequently, the top is fluid by design, and block producer candidates who earn enough votes can replace the block producers in power at any minute. Now, to get to the scandal, Start EOS, major block producers' explicit vote buying. Start EOS is a startup based in Chengdu, China. According to its website, the company entered blockchain industry in 2013. This year, Stardios has reportedly issued at least two products, the self-titled Digital Wallet and Memory Box, a one-tap access cold storage wallet. Currently, Stardios is the fourth largest block producer as per EOS network monitor data, meaning that it gets a large proportion of block producer revenue. On November 27th, Stardios published a Medium post titled, We're going to share block producer proceeds with you. This is the way we warm you up in the winter. <laughs> in it, the startup team claims that, quote, after delegating startEOS.io as proxy, you could get continuous and stable EOS revenue. That's a delegating. So that's the way of voting in EOS. You delegate one of these as your proxy. The winter of cryptocurrencies has come. How much faith do you, do you left to have <laughs> in the post reads, continuing, now Stardios is going to stay with you, our most important and best friends, and we are going to share the proceeds with you and make it through the difficulties together. <clears throat> Further, the Chinese startup outlines an instruction on how to claim the benefits. After selecting Stardios as a proxy, users can pick stable income, mining revenue mode, or random revenue mode, where they play lucky fruit slots machine with game tokens to get EOS revenue. Explicit vote buying seems to contradict decentralized and democratic blockchain policies advocated by the EOS administration in the project's original white paper. Its co-founder and chief technology officer, Daniel Larimer, wrote soon after EOS mainnet went live, quote, EOS is fundamentally different from other governments and blockchain communities in that its community wishes to operate at the highest possible ethical standard of voluntary consent and nonviolence. More specifically, Start EOS winter promotional campaign seems to violate Article 4, of the current EOS constitution titled No Vote Buying, which states the following, quote, no member shall offer nor accept anything of value in exchange for a vote of any type, nor shall any member unduly influence the vote of another. Community reaction calls for unvoting and constitutional reform. Expectedly, the crypto community, which traditionally, traditionally values decentralization, was not happy about an EOS block producer openly buying votes. On November 8th, Weeks before StartEOS published a Medium post explicitly describing how users can claim some of the revenue, EOS investor Maple Leaf Capital pointed out that StartEOS was launching a slot machine D app, where users allegedly could set StartEOS as a voting proxy to obtain in-game tokens. 
According to the original article describing the DApp, the rewards to its gamers would come directly from game.eos's BP reward, which in turn is owned by Sardios. Quote, it may not be bad intention, but it looks awfully close to transferring block producing reward value to its voters with a thin veil of gamification and probability attached to it. This could set a bad precedent and deserves some debate. Later, on November 29th, the investor announced it would discontinue voting for Stardios, arguing that swapping block rewards for votes in gaming form is detrimental to the long-term economic value for EOS. Steemit user The, Awaken, the Awakenment stresses that Games.EOS is holding a paid position, being ranked at 66th position. Game.EOS has since moved up to 50th place. He wrote in an open letter to EOS investors after contacting Stardios administration and failing to receive a response from them, stating, quote, if other block producers copy what Stardios is doing and launch a second or third block producer themselves, we will soon end up with the large block producers being owned and run by the same handful of owners. After the letter was published, a Stardios representative reportedly did message him, quote, they admitted to creating the games.eos account and admitted to collaborating with games.eos, but they told me they had different owners which does not match up with what they have stated on their own website. Australia-based crypto persona Crypto Tim, who covers mostly EOS-related news, published a video titled EOS Block Producer Stardios Are Vote Buying, <clears throat> which gathered some commentary from the community on Reddit and YouTube. On Twitter, he called for Stardios to be removed as a block producer. Some of the block producers have expressed their views on vote buying as well, albeit without directly mentioning Stardios. On November 27th, EOS New York, which is currently the eighth largest block producer, wrote that, quote, the EOS constitution is simply not good enough, and we deserve a clear document that outlines our basic system of governance, and then shared their proposal after being asked in the comment section whether the document features any restrictions on vote buying. EOS New York stated, quote, there are not. We have it now, and we have BP's block producers violating it. No point. <clears throat> Moreover, Stardios has reportedly been unvoted by at least one block producer, Bulgaria-based EOS Titan. Nevertheless, Stardios continues to hold the third or fourth positions in the block producer ranking, which suggests that it is still largely supported by other block producers. The list of Stardios supporters can be monitored by a resource powered by EOS Titan. According to their data, Stardios's largest ally is Huobi, which has been previously accused of running a mutual voting rig. There's a graph here of the block producer rankings, the top 21. Price drop. The EOS vote buying scandal has correlated with the token's massive price drop. EOS token's massive price drop. While it followed an overall bearish market trend, uh, <clears throat> the whole crypto market, the losses the EOS to US dollar experience were more significant comparing to other top coins. EOS is trading at $2.36 as of the time of this publication. It is, of course, now trading at $1.79. So we've had a big drop again since uh, this was published. Down around 25% over the past seven days, or even more so. <clears throat> Previous signs of centralization in the EOS protocol. I'm not going to go over that. Um, you can read that here in the article. I'm going to skip down. This is a fairly long article. I guess that was basically it. So I'm just going to finish up with the, the last couple paragraphs. The last paragraph. Still, EOS's Daniel Larimer has previously confirmed that his company does not aim to be decentralized. In an interview with YouTube blog Colin Fox Crypto, which aired on October 3rd, Larimer clarified his vision, quote, decentralization isn't what we're after. What we're after is anti-censorship and robustness against being shut down, end quote. So, I, you know, to me, that's a big weakness there for, for EOS in the long term. In the short run, I think they still have a huge amount of capital. There's still going to be a huge amount of development on it as long as the network can't be shut down as long as I, I mean the software can still be modified and it's still there's still uh, got big plans to implement future updates to the software so who knows what might happen but uh, it's its price will probably reflect changes that are yet to come but its price I don't I personally don't think it re really reflects the the value of uh, eos.io and what they're planning to put into the community overall. Um, I mean, they're planning on using that money. So, some of it's already gone to uh, other entities to, to develop, to find basically developers to build on the EOS platform. A lot of it, a big chunk. So, and there's probably more it, more of that going to happen in the future. So, that's going to attract a lot of development to EOS. And regardless of how people feel 
about it, I think in the long run, it's still going to have a lot of value. Well, maybe not in the long, long run, as we'll discuss later on in the show. Uh, but I think, you know, in the, over the next decade, I think EOS is going to be a major, a major force. So I, I don't, I think it's current price is, is undervalued personally. I think that if <laughs> people tend to vote with their feelings when they buy and sell crypto, instead of thinking too rationally about it, knowing all the details, but EOS isn't going away just because of start EOS, even though we may be frustrated with what they're doing, what EOS is doing with its constitution. Get on to the next and last article of the show. Ethereum Constantinople hard fork to come in mid January based on developers' new agreement. Ethereum core developers have agreed to launch the long awaited Constantinople hard fork at block 7,080,000, as decided in a bi weekly developers meeting on Friday, December 7th. Excuse me. The new agreement follows the previous decision to delay Constantinople fork. For late January 2019, due to a consensus issue that occurred during the upgrade trial on Robston on the Robston testnet in October. Talked about that in a previous show. Given the press time, Ethereum block time of 14.3 seconds and the number of remaining blocks of around 234,745, the Constantinople upgrade is likely to become active in around 38 days from press time or around January 14th, 2019 according to the data from the Ethereum blockchain explorer Etherscan. The upcoming Constantinople hard fork encompasses five separate Ethereum improvement protocol proposals, EIPs, in order to soften the transition from proof of work to more energy efficient proof of stake consensus algorithm. Once activated, the upgrade is supposed to fundamentally change the Ethereum blockchain with the synchronous nodes update to the entire system. Ethereum is a public open source blockchain a platform featuring smart contracts and its native cryptocurrency Ether, Launched on July 30th, 2015, Ethereum is now the third biggest cryptocurrency by market cap at around 9.7 billion and is trading at 94.67 as press time according to data from CoinMarket. Actually, let's just check. It's currently at 92.26. Gone down a little bit. Um, recently, Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin was granted an honorary doctorate from Switzerland Olds University, the University of Bale, Switzerland, for outstanding uh, achievements in fields of cryptocurrency, smart contracts, and the design of institutions. In November, analysts from Northeastern University and the University of Maryland claimed that the alleged existing lack of diversity in Ethereum smart contracts threatens the whole Ethereum blockchain ecosystem. Well, that's being worked on. Lots of things happening. Ethereum, uh, well, it's certainly had a lot of struggle the, the past, uh, past eight or nine months, maybe the past year, really, with um, demand. On the network, the load on the network. Changes are slowly happening, and I think you know they'll eventually overcome a lot of that. So Ethereum also is over the next decade a strong contender still, even though EOS has probably gonna be a lot faster, I think, in the short run and maybe even longer run. Okay, well that uh, does it for our news. The last is this week's Made Safe update. Development update for December 6th, 2018. Here are the main things to highlight this week. MadeSafe has seven new team members joining this week, of which three are interns. Great to see interns getting involved. I, I hope that continues to get some more interns in there. Uh, secondly, MadeSafe's happy to announce that snapshot releases of the Android library are available as Safe App Android and Safe App Android Dev on the OSS-snapshot-local Maven repository. The supporting API documentation is also available for reference. Number three, the API documentation for Safe App C Sharp is now available for reference. Number four, we made available a new patch release of the Safe App Node.js package, version 0.10.1, oh, which includes a fix for two minor issues. For more details about the changes, please refer to the change log. And number five, we published a new branch in the routing repository called Fleming uh, because we feel like the changes we've been working on behind closed doors for the last little while are definitely a step in the right direction. Please note that it is still very early days as aspects such as performance still need significant work before the code can make it into a testnet. And number six, as of this week, the routing team is split into two subteams. So I'll just read through the update, I guess. Being my last show, I'll give it a little more focus. Marketing. Marketing has been focused this week on creating 
material to help explain dynamic membership within the context of Parsec. You'll see the outcome of this work during the next week when we'll also be sending out a new subscriber newsletter. A reminder, if you haven't already, please sign up today in the footer of safenetwork.tech. That's for the mailing list, the newsletter. Uh, we've also finally taken down the Safe Network Wiki. Whilst it has contained some great information over the years, much of the content is now dated and instead it will be covered by a combination of the existing websites and other future work. This will enable us to keep the information up to date moving forwards. Finally, next week, Doug Campbell will be out speaking about SAFE at a meetup at Strathclyde University. The link here. We'll also be looking forward to welcoming a new start to the team from Monday, but more of that follow next week. Recruitment. After not having a recruitment update last week, we have a number of new starts who have joined the team this week. Hooray! We would like to welcome Calum, or Callum who has joined the QA team today as software test engineer. He will be working alongside Stefan C., Chriso, and Srini. We would also like to welcome some new faces to our Chennai office who are joined at the, who joined at the start of the week. We have six new starters, of which three are interns. Um, these are all uh, usernames on the forum, so they're not their real names. Yeah, so just so you know, I've already said the, the previous ones so Srini and Stefan C were also usernames, so not the real name. So username, so I'm not I, I probably should just skip over that. <laughs> I probably won't be able to say them very well anyway, but they're all linked here. If you want to know about them, please do check up the check out the update. Uh, next section. Oh wait. So we also have another new team member joining next week, but we will need to keep you in suspense until the next dev update. Okay. Secret. Uh, next section, safe API and apps. We have started planning the final test release phase of Safe App Java and Safe App C# Sharp APIs. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I, I should skip over this because I'm not gonna read it out very well. And really, it's more technical anyway. So I I really recommend if you're interested in what's going on with Safe Network, please do check out the update in full. It's it's always full of really interesting information and will give you a, a very clear picture of. Or clearer picture of what what's going on and how how the network is progressing. That you can see they're very busy. I mean they've they've just got tons of stuff happening every week. All right, so that will wrap up the first part of the show for this week. And uh, part two, I'm going to make some future crypto predictions. So let me just get straight into that. I've got uh, I think I've got three predictions here. Typo there. So first, my first prediction. First prediction. Are you ready? Uh, one, the most stable, flexible, and powerful network will be the one that comes to dominate the crypto space. Uh, to my mind, that crypto and network will be Safecoin and the Safe Network. And here's why. My first point about this is that the Safe Network farming is the most democratic means of securing a network ever conceived. Anyone and everyone can contribute without special hardware or having to heat their home with their farming device. So, safe network farming also allows people to store their own data in the most secure manner possible, all while giving the world a truly and absolutely anonymous, no blockchain form of fiscally limited hard money. Safe point. My second point the power of the safe network will drive a majority of developers to adopt it. There isn't much of a point in supporting a platform that fewer people use, which lacks in both flexibility and power. Just as MySpace gave way to Facebook, so too shall all other platforms yield ultimately to the safe network. It will not happen overnight, not even in a decade. However, immediately after the safe network is launched, the tide will begin turning. Any developer aiming for the long term with their project will recognize its superior qualities for scaling, anonymity, security, and fundraising, as well as as well as its immense flexibility. Of course, not every developer is focused on the bigger picture or even in maintaining their own projects long term. So long as other people support older crypto platforms, there will be reasons to develop for them. MySpace is still around after all. In reality, however, it's just a matter of time before MySpace and even Facebook fade into memory and are gone for good. The same will not be true for major cryptos like Bitcoin, as they will always have value as rare collectibles as they are managed in a decentralized manner. They will probably continue to exist for 100 years or more. That said, I fully expect that they will be nothing more than collectibles at that point in time. My second prediction for the future is that there will be more and more tethered cryptos. 
Just as the crypto known as Tether pioneered the linkage between crypto and the US dollar, we will see cryptos linked to every global commodity that one would wish to reasonably trade. This, in turn, shall allow crypto traders to diversify their holdings in a huge way and give them the ability to finally let go of fiat money. This dramatically changes everything. Humanity will finally be able to develop and grow without the parasitical banking and financial oligarchs clinging to our backs, dragging us down to Earth. In other words, humanity will finally be able to fly where our dreams will take us. My third prediction. Fully decentralized and open source exchanges on the safe network are what humanity needs and hence what will come to pass during the coming decade. This is crucial. For humanity to express its creativity and grow as a species, we must obtain the ability to trade without being extorted at every bend and turn. We must have genuine free trade. The extorters of the world will only increase their protection rates over time, bringing about a new dark age. In my opinion, building genuine free trade platforms is humanity's best hope for happiness. Finally, to wrap up my commentary, I would like to express in no uncertain terms that privacy, security, and anonymity are not disparate things. They are strongly connected things. In a word, they are freedom. A network that leaves one part of this equation out also leaves out ultimate freedom. The safe network aims to give humanity the full equation. It aims to give humanity our freedom, and with it, humanity will learn to fly. The road ahead will not be without bumps and problems. However, with freedom, we shall overcome. To quote my favorite Latin motto, ad astra per aspera, through the stars, through difficulties. My final part of this last episode is an explanation of why I'm stopping the regular show and moving along. Firstly, I created the show as a way to introduce people to the SAFE network, people who are interested in crypto but didn't yet know about the SAFE network. After a year of developing the show, I really feel now that I'm not making too much of an impact in this regard. Also, MadeSafe has been ramping up their marketing, and one must never outshine the master. <laughs> not that I could. In fact, I believe that MadeSafe are now and will into the future do a fantastic job of building awareness of the SAFE network. So. My original motivation is gone, and the cost-benefit for me just isn't there. Secondly, I want to build a better world for myself and for my friends. This current world does not measure up to my needs, wants, and dreams. I also believe that I'm not alone in that view. However, sitting and waiting for a better world to come at the expense of the sweat, pain, and tears of others is, to my mind, not only lazy, but foolhardy. I wouldn't feel like I deserve a better future if I didn't work for it in some way. To that end, I'm seeking to build an online community and then ultimately pushing even further ahead a physical community of singularists, those hardcore futurists like myself who are seeking the singularity, a place where we can work together as we move forward into the future. To begin with, and while it won't happen all at once, a new daily show is in the works, five days per week starting in the new year discussing ideas and new technology that may facilitate moving humanity forward into the singularity. I will also endeavor to talk about the SAFE network as often as possible on this new show, as the SAFE network, in my opinion, is a big part of the coming singularity. Next, a community site is being built, singularitysociety.io, which will have information and resources on the community and will ultimately house a multi-author blog where the new show will be also posted. Finally, I've created a Discord server, which you may join right now to keep abreast of updates and to participate in the conversation. Invite link to the Discord server is in the show notes. Well, that about wraps it all up. I'd like to thank all of the show's viewers for watching. It's been a really amazing year of up and then down. <laughs> Honestly, it's hard to believe that it's been a year already. Here's hoping that this coming year will bring more up than down for all of us. I'd also like to thank my occasional co-host, Jason, and a huge thank you to my frequent co-host, Mike. Hopefully you found this episode and the show in general to be informative and helpful. Please do say, stay subscribed to this channel to catch future special episodes that I will do when MadeSafe reaches new important milestones with the SAFE network. Until then, stay informed, keep hodling, and above all, stay safe. May you each find something worthwhile to keep you interested and busy as we move forward into the singular. Thank you.